Welcome back, Rec Watchers. I'm here with Dean McConaughey. We're doing our follow-up review of the Kraken 7-inch underwater monitor and talking about a Russian shipwreck. Dean, we are back at the dive shop. We talked about the Kraken 7-inch monitor uh, a little while ago, and then you said that you were taking off you're gonna take it down south and you're gonna test it out. Did too. You did, how did it go? It was awesome. For those of you that have seen the, uh, the first of the videos that we did, uh, you could probably see that I was kind of excited about this. That excitement has not changed. Wow. I love this thing. That's great. It is so easy and so amazing to use. I've missed having a monitor. I've missed having the ability to to use a monitor, specifically when I'm shooting video. And so to have the monitor back is a remarkable thing. To have it in this size and format that it's in is uh, is fabulous. And then some of the added features that are on it, specifically the exposure coverage and the, and the focus assist, uh, it's a dream. It's just so good. So just stepping back a little bit, you know, before when we're using under, like using video cameras in underwater housings, right you had a form of a monitor. Yeah, but absolutely. But now that we switched to first DSLR and now to the mirrorless cameras, that you know the, these small little cameras have a built-in monitor and we've got a little window on the housings to, to get an idea, but it's not the same as having that, that, that big screen monitor. It's not, and that's actually one of the challenges I had in the good old days with some of the other cameras. The monitors were typically like a three and a half inch or if you were really like, state-of-the-art it would maybe be like a four inch right. <laughs> heaven forbid so the monitor really gave you an ability to to monitor what you were filming to kind of look and see where you were pointing the camera none of them were high enough resolution to help you to understand focus or exposure well now that we have not only a larger monitor but there are focus and exposure tools within it it's a dream what kind of tools do you have? Is it there a histogram? What, what do you use for, expo for your exposure control? The answer is yes to kind of all of the above. Let me spin this thing around. Okay. This is sort of the format that it is in the water. Um, it's a bit of a beast. <laughs> but when we spin it around, it gives you the ability to see the monitor itself. So across the bottom are a whole series of control buttons. You've got power and zoom in and zoom out. So there is absolutely a histogram which allows you to look at uh, color differential and specifically exposure. There is an ability to do overexposure highlights as well. So imagine looking at a photograph or an image of what you're shooting and all of a sudden there are blocks of blue or blocks of green that pop up. So you can actually pick a color that you can see because yeah. some of us are color blind and right. don't have abilities to see specific colors. You can pick a color that is the highlight color for overexposure. Oh, great. So if you're in a position where you're looking at something and you've got these blue boxes showing up, it tells you that you need to make an adjustment to either your aperture or your shutter speed for your, for your exposure settings. And then focus is the same. Mm -hmm. There is a, a, a line pattern that shows up that talks peaking. about what's peaking, shows what's you in line. focus yeah. and what's out of focus. So one of the challenges if you're shooting a lot of little critters, a lot of macro stuff, is you're kind of looking at the camera and you're crossing your fingers, hoping <laughs> that things, yeah, you right? Oh yeah. Yep, hoping that things are focused. Mm -hmm. Well, now that we've got a screen that is not only 4K and detailed enough that we can see with our eye that the thing is focused, but then of course with the focus assist and the peaking as you've described, mm -hmm. um, that tells us for sure that we're actually getting the shot. Because the only thing worse than not seeing the critter is seeing the critter but blowing <laughs> the shot. And that is endlessly frustrating. The other tool, that I found during the trip that I thought was kind of gimmicky, I was completely wrong, has to do with a limitation on the screen. Okay. With video in particular, some of the more current video editing softwares after the fact have an ability to stabilize the video that you've shot. Yeah, you need, if you're gonna use any kind of image stabilization after the fact, then you wanna shoot wider than what you, what you think. So you have that room. So this has an ability to put a frame on the screen okay. to take that into account. So it gives you the safety zones, the safety boxes, so you know, uh, you're, you know if you're inside this box, you're guaranteed yeah. uh, to get what you think you're getting. And then on the outside, well, you know, <laughs> it's... It's it, brilliant. It, yeah, that Works is great. really, really well. Yeah. 
The last part has to do, I'll flip this on real quick so you can see it. Okay. The brightness. This thing is super bright. So a lot of times the traditional uh, units themselves, you needed like a sunshade or yes. something on top of them yep. in order to see the screen. There is no issues at all, even in direct sunlight of picking up the, the color and picking up some of the vision here. It's just an easy, easy thing to use. That is amazing. And just look at the difference. If you, if you look at the size of this screen compared to what you have in the back of the housing, uh, plus the ability to angle this. If you want to hold the camera down below you right. and look down on it, which is how I like to, to shoot. That's the magic. Um, yeah, because usually when I'm using uh, just a straight setup like that, then I'm looking at it and then I'm kind of adjusting. This hurts. Yes, it does. Getting the ability to get your arms and your elbows locked and get the camera down into a shooting position yeah. and then be able to angle it, like you said, to see it, so much more wow. comfortable. So tell me how you have this rigged up here. So yeah, a couple of things that I've learned about it. In the first video, I had thought with the air trapped inside the housing, uh, that this thing would be just about neutral. Wrong. <laughs> it's pretty negative. So in salt water, it's running about 900 grams. Okay. Now, to put that into perspective, each of these pods here, the, the taller ones, runs about 250 grams. So theoretically, we're looking for something maybe a little bit longer and a little bit fatter than this mm -hmm. in order to make it neutral. And that's yeah. why I've got these funny little things sticking up, yeah. just in order to add to some buoyancy. So in the mounting of this thing, theoretically, we want to mount it to the housing, and then we'll talk about buoyancy in a second. So one of the conversations about getting this thing on the top dead center, I found that there are a number of different ways to mount them. The unit itself has a ball mount on the bottom, and so we use our typical ball and clamp design, which is really common for underwater gear. I have found that because of a little bit of weight, having a hot shoe mount, you can do a hot shoe mount, but you've gotta be super critical of the size of the footprint of the square on the bottom of the hot shoe mount so that it doesn't woggle around on the inside because that translates to your monitor flipping around. That's gonna be more prevalent out of the water than in the water, right. but you just, you want some security here. I hate things that are moving around. Yeah. I'm fortunate enough with the Nauticam housing, we have what we call a blind hole. So there's actually a post that threads directly into a blind socket on the top of the housing. It's very secure, it's very strong, it's solid. I've got this sort of on an angular mount here to that blind hole, rather than what we talked about, the hot shoe mm -hmm. mount. So mounting it for some stability like that was, was really helpful. The other element has to do with stability. Because we've added this higher weight point, you want sort of a triangle on the bottom uh, or a footprint on your housing itself that is stable. Now, in my case here, I've got the dome lens on the front, right. so that creates a, a pretty good bit of stability. But in many cases, I'm not shooting with the dome, I'm shooting with a straight port on the front with macro lenses, and the thing wants to fall over all the time. <laughs> Less than helpful. So, one of the little toys that you and I were just talking about yeah. is this thing. I love this, this is so much fun. This is a tripod. An underwater tripod. Underwater tripod. Yeah. So this creates a three-point triangular footprint oh, that gives you the stability out of the water. And if you're shooting in the sand at night or doing some really close macro stuff, you can actually put this thing down on the sand or put it specifically on rock. Don't put it on coral. Put it on the rock <laughs> and use it for stabilization. They're brilliant. I've used them for years and they're an awful lot of fun. And of course, you've got the ball mounts on here. So if you needed to use this as another attachment point for something, right. uh, what would you what would you possibly attach to this if it's mounted on the bottom of the camera? So sometimes I'll just do a short arm, like a three inch or a five inch arm, uh, just in order to again create that sort of lock mm -hmm. point because I'm shooting this yeah. right, mm -hmm. and so you want that stability. But there's one other thing that you can do, is you can put eight inch or 12 inch arms on this thing out the back ah. and you can use them as handles if you're neutrally right the bell wow. went off yep. and it can float and you can point your camera like this in the water Excellent. which for any of you that have done underwater video in mid-water it's a dream <laughs> so this becomes a really interesting addition to create a number of different opportunities with how you're shooting this thing. That is awesome. I am very excited. I have not used one of these before. Uh, and now that you've shown this to me, I am definitely <laughs> going to be picking one up. It's one of those, um, oh, of course. Yes, yeah, why, why didn't I think of this Exactly. Before? Yeah, I've taken, I've taken some of my old photography tripods 
and uh, and you know worked that into it and somehow jerry rigged it to to fit to the bottom of the housing and then yep. try to use that and it gets the job done but it's it's awkward and yep. and unstable and it takes a lot of work to, to you do. have to be a bit careful too with the dive masters i yeah. mean the dive masters at the various locations are trying to protect the reef yeah you know you show up with a tripod you're going to put <laughs> this thing on the coral and yeah. obviously there's resistance yes so i think you know if you're showing respect and you're showing care the dive masters will start to understand that you're not you know climb it around the bottom wrecking things up yeah and they'll let you do it at that point but you gotta you gotta kind of earn that with them to that's begin right with. absolutely but that's the way to do it that's great now so we talked a little bit about uh, the, the the stability the buoyancy and you mentioned that you discovered another port uh, another port I did on the too. back of this so full of surprises dug it cracking bless him <laughs> um he called me and he said you know there's a hole in the bottom right and was like there's a hole in the bottom so underneath here is another 16 mil port. Wow. What that allows you to do is to move the bulkhead connection here down below. Now, not quite as important in the setup that I have here, but it gives you some more flexibility if you decide that you want the hose coming down or you want something a little bit cleaner as opposed to this sort of loop up the top. You've got some mounting capability here that is, is flexible and easy to adapt. So way to go, Doug. When you're filming underwater, Having lots of options is really good because you need that flexibility. You, Just to be adaptable. Every dive, every location is Changes. different. You need, to, you need to adjust your gear to, you to fit the environment. For any of the uh, pro guys that are out there, it does have a fully functional HDMI output port on it now. So there is a, a long ca cable, a long tether that mounts onto this that goes up to a surface video. So if you're shooting below and you want to see what's going on topside, you can monitor topside and see what's going on. And monitoring, that was one of the things that was a surprise when I'm diving. Everybody turned to me and said, it was super cool to peek over your shoulder oh, right. and see what you're doing. <laughs> I never thought it was a big deal. It's a big deal. It is. So absolutely excited about this and really the magic becomes figure out how to mount it to your own kit to your own housing mm -hmm. and then playing with it as far as buoyancy is concerned to get to the point where you found your comfort zone I've still got a little bit more work to do with this mm -hmm. but um, I've added another ball mount here on the front so I'm gonna put a buoyancy pod behind the monitor here yeah. and then figure this out because we're headed for truck lagoon and I'm mm -hmm. gonna go um, bend this again and the shipwrecks and see how we make out. And how, how easy was it for you to use the monitor underwater with the buttons? Are, were you pressing buttons underwater? Or are you, are you turn just, it on? <laughs> yeah, just turn it on and just go? Yeah. yeah, it's quite efficient as far as the battery is concerned, even in colder water, because batteries don't like cold water, mm -hmm. but it just turn it on and run the dive. So I ran uh, two and a half days on the battery. Okay. So, you know, wow. each, each dive was like an hour or 70 minutes in length. But it did get to the point the second day where it's kind of like, is it going to make it? Yeah. So I recommend, you know, at least changing the batteries out once a day so that mm -hmm. you're confident that it's going to make it through. But piece of cake, it was just awesome to shoot with this thing all over again. It was great. So Dean, you got to take this down, you got to try it out. And uh, now, did you do any cool filming with any kind of a shipwreck or what, what kind of stuff did you film with this? So for anybody who's been to Cayman Brac, you'll know about uh, the Russian or the Russian destroyer or what they call the Keith Tibbetts wreck. The Russian, okay. And I was able to get it. It's got quite of a quite an interesting history. So during the Cold War, the Russians built a destroyer okay. for the Cuban Navy. Really? This was for the Cubans to basically say, you know, hey, we're here and yeah. protect themselves from, you know, what was to the north, the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's, it was originally a Russian destroyer. Uh, its designation was 356. 356. And it did nothing. Uh, it basically sat in the dockyards in Cuba and went, okay. Just kind of a show of strength for the Cubans right. to say, hey, Americans, we've exactly. got some allies. We got a boat too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So at the end of the Cold War, the Cubans kind of looked at each other and go, well, what are we going to do with this? <laughs> so they sold it to the tourism board in the in the Grand Cayman Islands, okay. the, the, Cayman, the Cayman group. Yeah. So the boat was built in 1984, went sort of through all of its stuff. And then in 1996, they scuttled it off the northwest coast of Cayman Brac. So it went down intact. It landed on its keel, so they did it right. And they sank it there specifically as an artificial reef and a, and a dive site. In 2004, I believe, a storm went through and pulled the thing apart. Oh, wow. Now, if you think about what a hurricane or a tropical storm can do, this is between 50 and about 100 feet deep. So the storm reached down, picked the boat up, pulled it apart, put the <laughs> boat back down again. 
Storms down south are nothing to be trifled with. So this is a shipwreck that was wrecked after it sank. Correct. Yes, exactly <laughs> wow. right. So it's kind of like the one that it keeps on giving or something yep, like that. Yep. So the cool thing about the Caymans, for anybody who hasn't been there, uh, the Cayman Islands are basically all sand. So with the amount of sand, what happens is all of the particulate in the water typically settles to the bottom. So you've got clear water to begin with. And then because you've got clear water and sand, sand acts like a mirror on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So the light that bounces off the sand bounces back up. So the Cayman Islands are very bright, which makes it an ideal filming condition. So you turn around and add 175 feet to 200 feet of visibility with all of these bright light conditions. I mean, it's, it's just a dream to shoot. And 1984, that's a pretty recent destroyer to be built, right? It's true, it's wow. true. Just something to make a statement. So you've got it all here, folks. We're talking about the Kraken seven inch monitor and a Russian shipwreck. And thank you, Dean, for, for talking with us today, sharing your experience with us and telling us about this very cool shipwreck. Amazing. For the first video, we basically had just unboxed it and had looked at it. It was days old at that point. Exactly. And now to take it down and to use it in a real world test is amazing. So I got to go clean the salt off it now. Yeah, that's right. I am so excited about this monitor. And I can't wait to get my hands on it and you to take it for take it for a dive. Hopefully this coming year, oh, yeah. we'll be doing some stuff. Thanks for watching, guys. Thank you, Dean. Uh, stay tuned. We have a lot more coming up. Uh, some really cool gear that's coming out in 2023 and we're going to be here with Dean looking at all of it. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the like, hit the notifications bell, share it with all of your friends, your dog, your daughter, your cat, uh, fish, whoever scuba dives or is interested in shipwrecks. And remember, deep down, we care.